series. Today for our Experts in Emotion interview, we'll be speaking with Dr. Daniel Gilbert, a professor of psychology at Harvard University on happiness. Dr. Gilbert um, is a professor of psychology and has won numerous awards for his research and teaching, including the American Psychological Association's Distinguished Scientific Award for an Early Career Contribution to Psychology, and in 2008 he was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. His 2007 book, Stumbling on Happiness, spent six months on the New York Times bestseller list, has been translated into 30 languages, and was awarded the Royal Society's General Book Prize for the Best Science Book of the Year. In 2010, he hosted and co-wrote the award-winning Novus television series, This Emotional Life, which has been seen by more than 10 million viewers. He's also a contributor to Time, The New York Times, and NPR's All Things Considered, and has been a guest on numerous television shows, including The Today Show, Charlie Rose, 2020, and The Colbert Report. So finally, his first TED Talk on happiness is now one of the 15 most popular of all time. So I now turn to our very special Experts in Emotion interview together with Dr. Daniel Gilbert on happiness. Welcome, Dan. Thanks for speaking with us today. Thanks for asking me to do this, June. Oh, thank you. Um, one of the things I thought might be a nice way to start our conversation today is to hear a little bit about where your journey began, sort of what first got you interested in the topic of emotion and happiness. Right. You know, it's funny, I, I never thought of myself as an emotion researcher, mm -hmm. and in most ways I still don't. I began my career as a science fiction writer. Before I was a psychologist, I wrote science fiction. And so my obsession has always been with how human beings think about the future. But if you ask why human beings think about the future, mm -hmm. the main answer is so they can get to good ones rather than bad ones. What's a good future? A good future is one in which we're experiencing positive emotions. So very quickly, if you're interested in why and how human beings think about the future, you become a student of emotion. We're looking into the future so that we can find more happiness, more pleasure, less pain. So you very quickly get into the psychology of those particular emotions, and that's what's happened to me. So serendipitously, you came across happiness by thinking about the future. Exactly right. Absolutely. So I want to ask you then a little bit about your work on this topic. So, I mean, you're widely known for your New York Times bestseller book, Stumbling on Happiness. Um, that's now been translated into over 20, probably even more at this point, you know, different languages. Um, and in yeah, your book... Canadian and Australian is two separate ones. It's been translated into many. <laughs> Australian is a different dialect. <sighs> I mean, in your book, what's really interesting and fun here is that you really challenge this idea that many of us have that happiness seems to depend on getting what we want or sort of having things go as planned. And I wondered if you could say a little bit about how our sort of everyday beliefs about what makes us happy might actually be wrong or sort of steering us in the, you know, perhaps less correct direction. Right. Well, you know, most people have a basic theory about happiness, and this is the theory people have had about happiness for thousands of years, as long as they've been writing. The theory goes like this. Happiness is what happens when I get what I want, and I usually don't get what I want, so I'm not always happy. But if I could get what I want, then I would be happy. So happiness is just the product of achieving our goals. But now for the first time in human history, we have large populations of people living on the face of our planet who actually have everything they want. And guess what? They're not always happy. So, you know, there's another beautiful theory shot down by an ugly fact. Mm -hmm. It can't be the case that happiness is what happens when we get what we want. So why are we ever unhappy? The answer, I think, is we often want the wrong things. We are uh, chasing things that will not actually provide happiness, avoiding things that will not provide as much uh, uh, pain or displeasure as we anticipate. So I've been really quite taken with uh, our inability to look into our own future and figure out what will make us happy, how happy it will make us, and how long that happiness will last. Um, my colleague and collaborator Tim Wilson and I have really spent the last 15 years trying to understand what human beings do wrong when they try to imagine the future and figure out what will make them happy. And I think the errors we make come in two basic kinds. First, there are errors of imagination. You know, imagination is a wonderful capacity. We're the only animal on the planet that has anything like the ability to close our eyes and imagine futures uh, that haven't yet happened. And yet it's still kind of in beta testing. We've only been able to do this uh, for a couple of million years. So imagination is flawed. 
You know, when I ask you to imagine what it would be like to get married or have a baby or win the lottery or get tenure or eat a cupcake, you do a pretty good job, but not a perfect job. And the ways in which you do an imperfect job have been fascinating to me and Tim Wilson. So there are errors of imagination. The other reasons that we chase the wrong things in our pursuit of happiness is that we're members of a culture, we're members of a society, we're members of families. And every one of us is surrounded by a, uh, you know, a big herd of um, aunts and uncles and rabbis and priests and philosophers and grandmothers and bartenders and taxi drivers, and they all will tell us what kinds of things we need to do to have a happy life. It turns out that some of that cultural wisdom is right, but some of that cultural wisdom is wrong. So we make errors when we think about what will make us happy because our own imaginations fail us and in a sense our mothers fail us too. <laughs> so when you talk about imagination, I know you've done a lot of work of this sort of imagining our future emotional selves or you know, engaging in what you call affective forecasting. And I wonder if you could say a little bit about just how our imagination goes awry when we try to project how we're gonna feel in the future. Well, our we make several different uh, independent errors when we try to imagine the future. But surely one of the ones that I've been most intrigued by is our, our inability to realize quite how adaptable we are. Human beings get used to almost anything. And that's really good when uh, the thing you're getting used to is the loss of a loved one uh, or a physical handicap. And it's really bad when the thing you're getting used to is a, a new love affair or a promotion at work. But human beings quickly adapt to almost any circumstance. Uh, that's not remarkable. To me, what's remarkable is we don't seem to know this about ourselves. And so if you ask people questions like, how happy would you be if you want a million dollars? They say, oh my gosh, I'd jump for joy. And they're right. But if you ask, how happy will you be a year later? They mainly say, well, I'd probably still be jumping. Not quite as high, but jumping. And they're wrong. Within a year, they're going to adapt to that new level of income. So one of the mistakes we make, one of the key mistakes we make, is not realizing the speed with which we will adapt to virtually any circumstance. Interesting. And when we think about, you know, the sense to which we're sort of more adaptable, more malleable than we give ourselves credit for, perhaps. That's absolutely true. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, in the negative case, we are a species that picks itself up by, our, uh, by its bootstraps. I guess. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, we think of ourselves as kind of this field of fragile flowers that has to go running to our therapist every time our shoelaces break. Mm -hmm. But the truth is that human beings weather virtually every circumstance. If you look at the literature on trauma and tragedy, people are indeed, uh, they, they feel bad when bad things happen. Don't get me wrong. It's not good to uh, lose a loved one. It's not good to lose the use of your legs. But what's remarkable is how quickly we overcome these circumstances. Not everybody, but almost everybody. And I'm just fascinated by the fact that we don't know this about ourselves. Um, human beings are famous in the psychological literature for overestimating how good they are at all sorts of things. This is something we're really good at, and we don't know we have this remarkable hidden talent. And another fact, I mean, that you've talked about when it comes to you know, our own knowledge about happiness um, and how we're going to feel in the future is this idea of natural versus synthetic happiness, right? And sort of our knowledge about the kinds of things we think are going to make us happy. And I wonder if you could say just a little bit about that. Well, you know, these terms are just terms I use to yeah. describe the yeah. kind of happiness we get when we get what we want. That's natural happiness. Mm -hmm. And the kind of happiness we manufacture for ourselves when we don't get what we want. And that I've referred to as synthetic happiness. I don't think there's actually a big qualitative distinction between the two. And what's remarkable to me is that people are very, very good at manufacturing happiness when they don't get what they want. Um, you know, the moment your fiance throws that engagement ring back in your face and starts walking out the door, as she's leaving, you're looking at her going, you know, she was never really that cute. And, you know, we never really had that much in common. And this is actually a pretty good opportunity for me to start a whole new life. Now, I'm kidding, of course. You don't do that the minute it happens. But it's remarkable how quickly the mind starts to look for ways to make things better. You know, reality is ambiguous. Social reality is particularly ambiguous. There are lots of ways to think of something. Um, Yes, I lost my job, and that means I'm going to have trouble paying my rent. But the other way to think about this is a whole new opportunity to become a poet. 
there's good and there's bad ways to frame almost anything. And the mm -hmm. mind is very good at finding the good ways. Now, if you are selling that, you call it coping. If you're curing that, you call it rationalization. If you're studying it, you call it cognitive dissonance reduction. Mm -hmm. But it's all basically one thing. It's the mind finding ways to see the world that will make the person who owns the mind feel better about it. That's what I mean by manufacturing synthetic happiness. We're really good at it, most of us, and we don't know we're really good at it. So how do you think then we can harness these facts about our minds, things we may be aware of and some of the things you point out that we're less aware of or maybe appreciate less than we ought to? How can we use this knowledge to really find the true secrets of happiness, something so many people are you know, so zealous about wanting to attain and find? <laughs> you know, I love the phrase, the secret of happiness, yeah. uh, because it's like the phrase to me, the secret of weight loss. There's no secret. OK, the second law of thermodynamics tells you that if you take in fewer calories than you expend, you lose weight. It's not a secret. The same is true for happiness. We've known for a long time through folklore what kinds of things bring happiness. And science has by and large shown that the things we suspected are right. So there isn't a secret to happiness, but if you ask me, you know, what kinds of things uh, has science taught us, uh, even if it's reaffirmed things we already knew, um, I would say it comes, there's a few things we probably know about happiness. First is don't expect to live there. Happiness is a place we visit. It's not a place we move into. Emotions are meant to be labile. They're meant to change. Your emotions are a compass that guide you through your journey of life, and a compass that's always stuck on north is pretty much useless. So nobody should want to get into a state of permanent uh, happiness. Um, if you expect to be happy all the time, you will be very unhappy. The second thing I would say is to watch other people. You know, imagination's a fickle friend. It betrays us in many ways when we look into the future and try to figure out what will make us happy. But we've discovered in our own research that one way to know what will make you happy is to look and see what makes other people happy. Mm -hmm. You know, we have this illusion that we're quite unique and that the things that make others happy probably won't make us happy. Mm -hmm. Hogwash. We're almost all exactly the same when it comes to happiness. Um, if an alien from Mars knew exactly what made any one randomly selected human being on our planet happy, it would know 90% of what there is to know about everybody else. Um, you know, would you rather have a punch in the mouth or chocolate ice cream, gallbladder surgery or a weekend in Paris? These are, you know, one item IQ tests. Everybody answers them the same. So other people's experiences can tell you a lot about what will make you happy. Finally, um, you know, there's a big tradition in psychological and sociological and economic research of just looking at the correlates of happiness. Uh, what are the things we know about the people who seem happiest on our planet? And there's lots of things, you know, yeah, money is, uh, is useful to have, health matters, um, you know, freedom and security, blah, 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 blah. Is there one thing that matters most? Yes, there is. We're the social animal. And it's our relationships. And if you could only tend to one thing in your life and improve it and expand it in order to make yourself happier, I would suggest it be your social relationships, your family relationships, and your friendship network. People who have close family members and close friendships are rarely seriously unhappy people. Mm. So it's really all about connecting with others and making a meaningful social life in many ways, right? I mean, it sounds trite. It sounds like something off a Hallmark card. And we go, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but, but what's the secret of happiness? I'm sorry. <laughs> that's like the second law of thermodynamics. That's the secret. That's a, that's a wonderful way to think about it, you know. Um, I often think of some, you know, of my favorite songs that say, you know, all you need is love, right? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, um, you don't even need love. Um, love's great, mm -hmm. but you can get a big boost just out of conversation. You know, we know that one of the things that makes people unhappy is mind wandering. When the mind wanders, it often wanders to bad things. And even when it wanders to good things, it doesn't usually improve our mood. But one of the things that holds us in place, keeps us in the here and now, is human interaction. As I'm sitting here talking to you, I'm not kind of thinking about that dentist appointment next week or wondering if I really should have said the thing I said to my wife earlier this morning. My mind is here. One of the ways in which social interaction keeps us happy is just by keeping us in the moment. So you don't even have to have love. You can actually just have a good chat with somebody at Starbucks about what happened in politics the day before, and it's likely to make you happier. And keep you present focused, too. And keep you present focused. Right. 
So one of the other things that I really love in the work you do among, uh, among so many things is that um, some recent work um, where you found that people systematically underestimate how much they're going to change in the future when it comes to personality traits, personal values, and even you know, preferences. And it sounds like from your work, it, people come to believe that they've changed more you know, in the past 10 years than they will in the upcoming decade. And I just wonder, you know, what do you think this suggests about our understanding of ourselves and who we're going to be in the future and what we're going to want? Well, the phenomenon you're talking about is something we've called the end of history illusion, this mm -hmm. feeling that people have at every age from 18 to 68 that they've changed a lot in the past, but they're pretty much done changing. They finally become the person they will pretty much always be. Yes, I'll have less hair. Well, for me, that's not possible. Uh, and more pounds as I age, but I'll still be fundamentally the same Dan Gilbert. I do feel that now at the age of 55, but I also felt that at the age of 25. So what we've established is that this is actually a widespread illusion among people of all ages. But I think it's part and parcel of a bigger piece of our psychology. Um, we're very much prisoners of the moment. Uh, as, as you've said in your own work, uh, we're stuck in time. We're here now. And our, our perceptual reality of the here and now is quite palpable and quite powerful. And it's very difficult for the mind to escape the moment and travel to the future or travel to the past. So I've referred to this phenomenon as presentism, the ten our tendency to be kind of stuck in mm -hmm. now. When you try to imagine yourself in 10 years, it's really hard to do. That's a very difficult cognitive process. Who will I be in 10 years? What will I be? What will I be doing? What will I want? How might my values change? And I think what happens is when we have trouble imagining ourselves being different, we mistakenly conclude that that means we won't be. Actually, what it means is that imagining yourself in the future is a hard thing to do. We should scratch our heads and go, I just can't imagine myself 10 years from now, and so I'm uncertain. But instead we say, I can't imagine myself 10 years from now. I guess that means I'm gonna be the same guy I'll always be. The problem with this, of course, is that by overestimating the stability of our current selves, of our personalities, values, and preferences, we can make bad decision-making errors. So for example, we asked in one study, we asked people to uh, how much they would pay to see their current favorite band play a concert in 10 years. And on average, they told us about 130 bucks. But when we asked them how much they would pay to see a concert right now by the band that was their favorite 10 years ago, they said only about 80 bucks. So people recognize that they don't now love the band they used to love 10 years ago quite so much. And yet they're very confident that in 10 years, Radiohead is still going to be the band that they really want to see. So you can see that this end of history illusion uh, can bedevil our decision making. Well, when it comes to Radiohead, perhaps that's timeless. <laughs> <laughs> Ten years from now, let's get back together and see how you feel see about it. See how I feel. I mean, in some ways, you know, what it suggests is that we're more comfortable sticking in this sort of more pleasant, comfortable present as opposed to a more uncertain and perhaps anxiety-ridden future where we don't know what's going to happen. Things are out of our control, unpredictable. I do think it's comforting to believe yeah. that you finally arrived. The mm -hmm. development is a process that's tumultuous, mm -hmm. it's hard, it's revolutionary and evolutionary, mm -hmm. but finally I'm done. I'm finally fully formed. It's delivered me to this moment and uh, I can be this Dan Gilbert for the rest of my life. I do think most people take some comfort in that. Uh, so I think that's probably one of the things that causes the end of history illusion. Personally. I'm rather glad to know that I'm going to completely transform. I plan to be a six foot tall blonde Swedish man <laughs> in about 10 years. <laughs> he, you know, you never know, right? So, odds are small. <laughs> I mean, I'm just wondering what kind of implications you think this has. You've talked a little bit about, um, you know, the kinds of things we think we're going to invest money in in the future. But this sense of, you know, our future selves being relatively stable versions of our current selves, how do you think this will affect the kind of choices we make, you know, um, in terms of saving money for a trip or putting, you know, time and money into, you know, investing for right. college? Um, how does this change the kinds of choices we make in terms of what we think is going to make us happy? Because much of our time is spent building towards this future self That's who's right. going to be happy. Well, I think it suggests that we're going to make mistakes and it mm -hmm. even suggests what kind of mistakes we're going to make. 
we're going to tend to build futures that our current selves like, but that our future selves don't. I think the classic example is the tattoo. A tattoo is a commitment to a piece of art on your body for the rest of your life. Now, you know, they can mostly be removed, but it's long and arduous. By and large, when you get a tattoo, you're saying, not only do I like this now, but I will always like this. And I see young people walking around all the time with these very cool tattoos, and they look extraordinarily hip. And they're not going to look extraordinarily hip when they're grandparents or when they're the CEOs of large multinational corporations or when they're soccer moms. <laughs> but they believe at a young age that if I get a tattoo now, I'll always like it. Now, we make fun of young people because we think they don't have much foresight. They don't realize that they're going to change. And what I love about our research is it turns out their grandparents make the same mistakes, just not with tattoos. But 50-year-old people vastly underestimate how much they're going to change between 50 and 60. So this isn't just an error for young people. It's an error we all make. How can it change? How can knowing about this change our decision making? I think probably the, uh, uh, the watchword is options. Mm -hmm. That is, to the extent that you realize you are likely to change much more than you would intuitively think, but change in ways you can't predict, you leave your options open. You don't make serious commitments to things in the long term. You know, most choices are not just for the moment. If I decide what to have for lunch right now, I'm, I'm deciding what will make me happy now. But when I go grocery shopping, I'm deciding what will make me happy for the entire week. Most decisions are decisions about what our future selves will want. If we recognize that our future selves are likely to be different than our current selves in ways we can't predict, we leave our options open. So we shop for three days instead of 30 days. We sign up for a six-month gym membership instead of a 10-year gym membership. We get uh, a henna tattoo rather than the kind <laughs> that has to be removed with a laser. <laughs> I mean, it makes you think, too, um, in some of the professional goals that, you know, uh, academic scholars like yourself pursue. We're constantly pursuing these long, long-term goals, right? And um, we're sort of set up in a profession that's having us work towards goals that, in many ways, perhaps we don't know if those are going to be the same goals that we're going to want in two years or five years. That's right. And, mm -hmm. you know, I'm so, I don't mean to be suggesting we should all live for the moment and forget about the future. Sure. Far from it. I'm a big believer in long-term future mm -hmm. planning. But I think what we have to do is make a plan for the future, knowing that our future selves might not be very happy with it. And so there are exit strategies all along the way. We allow ourselves room to grow. And as we sort of think about growing and in into the future, it makes me think of a question I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on, which are, you know, you've done such wide-reaching work on happiness, mind-wandering, this idea of our future selves, how we're going to feel, how we're going to imagine our future selves to be. And when we then think about the future of the field of emotion, it feels funny to ask you this question now of sort of, well, where do you think it's headed? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, first of all, yeah. um, uh, I hope it's headed for oblivion which is to say almost any interesting field should transform so that 30 years later it's not recognizable. Um, emotion is an artificial category. Emotion is uh, an English word, and English words don't carve nature at its joints. Um, you know, think of words like um, time and space. They're very different words, and so we thought they were very different things. And Einstein came along and said, you know, these two categories you have of time and space it's an artificial distinction. Time and space are actually the same thing, four dimensions of the same thing. I think that's instructive. Right now, we think there's a study of a thing called emotion. But emotion is just some dimension of our subjective experience. Subjective experiences have this quality of being good or bad, mm -hmm. of feeling uh, positive or negative. They have a mm -hmm. valence. Mm -hmm. And we should be very interested in that fact. But it's not a fact that's somehow separate from all the other facts about us as human beings. I mean, when are we, when are we not experiencing an emotion? When are we not having an emotional experience? I think we always are. So I think as we come to understand more about the body, about the brain, and about the mind, this distinction between emotion and, say, cognition is really going to disappear. Uh, with that said, you've asked me to make a prediction about the future of my field. And, you know, if you go back and look at scientists making predictions about the futures of their field, they're almost always wrong. And that's because if I actually knew what the future of my field would be, I'd be 
doing that. I'd be there. So for somebody who studies how bad predictors are, I'm going to sit back and say the only thing I predict about the study of emotion is that it's going to be really, really exciting. That's a pretty good prediction. <laughs> Can't go wrong there. <laughs> so, I mean, related to this then, um, when you have students coming to you, undergraduates or graduate students or just general interested people wanting to pursue topics like emotion or happiness, mm -hmm. what kind of advice do you give them? Well, I think for somebody who is uh, starting out in the study of emotion, mm -hmm. um, first of all, I'd say bravo you are studying the single most important thing about human beings. Now that may sound self-serving, but it really isn't. Think about what, you know, Plato said this. He said, when we say something is good or bad, what are we really saying about it except that it brings pleasure or pain to human beings? By studying hedonics, by studying what makes us feel good or bad, you're studying the essence of what we're doing here on Earth. I mean, to me, emotion defines value, which is to say, nothing is good or bad in the world except because of the emotions or feelings that it brings to human beings. And so I think you're studying the single most central aspect of the human condition. So congratulations. <laughs> um, practical advice, certainly uh, you need to understand physiology, and you need to understand neuroscience. This is where lots of exciting things are happening in the study of emotion, connecting our deep understanding of it as a subjective experience to our understanding of how the body and the brain produce and modulate it. So I think anybody only understands the physiology or only understands the psychology is going to be left out of the future. I think the future belongs to those who really are gonna understand how to put these two things together. But I suppose my, my watchword would be, don't forget that what matters about emotion is subjective experience. What matters is that we feel them. And if we didn't, we wouldn't care very much about them. I think it's gonna be very easy in the future as we, particularly as we gain expertise, more expertise in uh, the neurosciences to lose sight of the experiencer, of the person who's having the emotion. And I think if we do that, we've lost sight of why we're studying emotion in the first place. Well, thank you so much for speaking today. It was a pleasure. Mine too. So this concludes our Experts in Emotion interview with Dr. Daniel Gilbert from Harvard University.